everybody. Got some questions for uh, homework review, exam review, whatever you want. This, this space today and tomorrow, all for you. Totally wide open. Whatever is on your priority list of stuff to talk about, that's what we'll spend our time with. Yeah. What's up, Lucy? And it, people haven't really been doing this um, this quarter with the online sessions, but using the microphone is okay. If you want to speak over your microphone, got no problems with that. I can hear you. Oh, um, I think so. Uh, the code word uh, did I gave a code word out yesterday, right, everyone? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I so. In general, if if students just miss the code word somehow, um, talk to me about it. <laughs> I could get it fixed. Um, I think I, I think yesterday I gave out the code word a little earlier than I usually do. Um, I think it happened a little earlier in the lecture, if I remember right. Um, but uh, but yeah, it, it was in there, Lucy. And if if you're if you're having trouble finding it, um, maybe we can talk after class is over. Sure. Okay. Mm. All right, how do how do people want to use time today? I'm really I'm really dependent on you. I mean, I can I guess I could come up with uh, an agenda of things and to use our time productively, but it's going to be way better if it's directed by you. Um, so that we spend our time on the things that are the highest priorities, uh, the things you're m most in, in need of some clarification on uh, or want to get more practice with. Um, I did send out the homework answers yesterday. Uh, so those are, those are, maybe you saw that email, those are available. Um, were there, if anyone took a look at that, were there, were there, was there anything goofy that was happening in my answers that you're wondering about or expectations for the exam, anything Anything at all that's on your radar. Can we talk about um, exercise three about the uh, Table. Um, when I'm doing the homework, I don't think I understand clearly which which exercise is that because we got three chapters here uh, to go off of. I do have the um, homework up here, and I can do some screen sharing. Uh huh. Okay. So the the SCT NCT stuff. Okay. Here, let me get the uh, screen sharing going, and so we can all be looking at the homework together. And other people, feel free to drop things into the chat about what are your priorities, and we'll kind of address them as we go. Even if we're working on something else, feel free to drop something in there, and I'll be keeping an eye on it. Oh, the screen sharing function sometimes throws things for a loop. Okay, here we go. So Parker asks, if we don't have anything um, but we have a question later, are we free to contact you? Uh, no, absolutely not. This is the only time for us to talk. I'm being facetious. Uh, of course you can contact me. <laughs> I've been um, encouraging this uh, nonstop. And uh, today, um, I'm hosting a, a special 
extension lab uh, from 1.30 to 2.30, just like we do on Tuesdays. Same link that got you here for the lecture today is the link that'll get you into that. Um, and Parker says, the only confusion I have at the moment would be the definitions for target and the loose definition of NCT and NCT. So maybe going over SCT, NCT will help here. Um, uh, called you at like 11.30 yesterday wondering what statistical generalizations are. I, I don't, somehow I missed that, Adrian. Um, uh, I'm sorry about that. Uh, we can definitely talk on the phone. Um, if you don't hear from me, shoot me another text because maybe something goofy happened. Um, my, uh, here, I'll, I'll drop my phone number in again just to make sure it was the right number. Um, here's my, here's my number again. Um, two zero six nine Go over some chapter 10 stuff. Yep, yep, yep. Um, okay. Um, Danny says, technology hates me today. I can't pull up the homework and have Skype open at the same time. Huh. Um, well, maybe this will help, uh, having the screen sharing up so you can, you can take a look at it on, through, through Skype. Um, I'll try to be following along here with these. Um, okay, so, actually, um, one thing that might be a good idea, maybe I'm not going to share, let, let's do this review, because I was talking through SCT NCT yesterday verbally, and maybe it would help to have the whiteboard up a little bit here, uh, to just really nail this down. Um, Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna open up uh, this uh, Microsoft Paint uh, Paint is not behaving. What the heck? It's like the simplest application in the suite. <laughs> yeah, let me. I got a solution for this though. Um, so again, um, let, let's just talk the big picture while I'm getting Microsoft Paint booted up here. Um, the, the main game here with SCT and NCT is that we want to test hypotheses. So we make these hypotheses that some candidate condition is sufficient for some target condition, or that some um, some candidate condition is necessary for another condition. Yeah, it's not up yet, Lucy. It's still it's still working. Um, so I'm, my computer is is not behaving. Uh, it'll be here in a second. Um, so we're we're testing these hypotheses of some candidate being necessary or sufficient for some target. Um, and the way that we test those claims is by comparing them against the world, making the, the observations of the world. So in all these SCT, NCT problems, you're getting a data plot that's just recording, here was a scenario, here's what we observed in that scenario. Here's another scenario, here's what we observed in that scenario. So it's like a, an, an indexing of a bunch of facts from observations. So the way the, the tests work is that there's a pattern to how you analyze that data and compare it against the hypothesis to see if the data falsifies that hypothesis. So how would I know if, a, if the hypothesis that some candidate was sufficient for a target? Well, that could be contradicted by the world. The world's going to be like, that's not sufficient for this other thing. Under a case in which the candidate is present and the target is not present. That's the kind of case that would falsify a claim that the candidate is sufficient for the target. And that's what I want to draw up on the whiteboard if I can get this thing going. Uh, and it's not going. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll keep talking here, try to use the space productively while I'm figuring this out. Um, I'm just going to restart it. Uh, and the same thing with the necessary condition test, except the counterexamples that disprove that something is uh, necessary for something else looks different. Um, so, why is this not behaving? Ugh. What's the difference between SCT and NCT? Are, are you wondering about the difference between sufficient condition claims versus necessary condition claims? Or are you asking something a little different?
just the claim. Okay, so if I'm saying something is sufficient for something else, like a candidate is sufficient for a target, I'm saying that all it takes to make the target happen is to have the candidate present. So like in my examples before, um, cutting off my head is a sufficient condition for killing me. If you cut off my head, that's all it takes to kill me. Nothing more is required. That all by itself is enough to make it happen. Um, if we're talking about a necessary condition claim, we're saying the candidate must be present if the target's going to be present. You don't have the target without the candidate. Um, so here, let, let's do, let me um, set this up. Now that I've got the, the whiteboard is visible, everyone can see this. Okay, cool. So here we go. Um, the, what I have in the quotation here, this is like the hypothesis that we're testing for. And <clears throat> when we translate claims about necessity and sufficiency into logic, this is how we can recover what the counterexamples are. So if I was going to say, can it, you remember the, the sun principle, right? The antecedent, or, or actually here, let me shoot. <laughs> let's, let's do this differently. The sun principle, I want to draw this right. And not just the word sun. Um, but here, here's what's really going on. So we've got sufficient, then we've got the horseshoe for the conditional, and necessary over here. So what the sun principle helps you remember is that the antecedent of a conditional, the first part of the conditional, is a sufficient condition for the consequent. When I say if A then B, I'm saying A is sufficient for B. I'm also at the same time saying B is necessary for A. Okay, so that's why this is useful. And we use this as a way to remember how to translate claims about sufficiency and necessity into formal logic. So candidate target is how it looks for SCT. And for NCT, if I'm saying the candidate is necessary for the target, then the candidate needs to go in the necessary condition spot. So the target's going to be over there, and the candidate is going to be over here. And then we'll put the horseshoe in between. So saying a candidate is sufficient for the target is saying if the candidate is present, then the target will be present. If you're saying the candidate is necessary for the target, that's the same thing as saying if you've got the target, then that means you've got the candidate. And if we remember the truth tables for conditionals, we know there's only one case in which these things are false. The only case in which a conditional is false is when the first part is true and the second part the uh, second part <laughs> is false. Okay, so there we go. So this scenario ends up defining the counterexample that we're hunting for when we're going to look through the data and see if the data contradicts the hypothesis. For the SCT, if there's ever a case where the candidate is present and the target is not present, if there's even just one case like that, that disproves the idea that the candidate is sufficient for the target. One counterexample is all it takes. If I'm looking at the necessary condition test, where I'm looking at claims that say the candidate is necessary for the target, if there's ever a case where you've got the target and you don't have the candidate, then that disproves the idea that this candidate is necessary for this target. So the, these patterns define what you have to be hunting for when you're analyzing these sets of cases in one of these problems um, and looking to see whether the data confirms or falsifies the hypothesis. Okay, so that's the big picture setup here. Let me share um, the homework again. Is this helping for those of you, there are a couple people asking about SCT, NCT. Is this, is this starting to bring it back into focus? Yes, no, uh. <laughs> yes, okay, cool. So Parker, you're talking about loose definitions of SCT, NCT. What I just gave on the whiteboard is like the technical way, the like in all the detail. So if, let's say, uh, let's skip to some of these that we haven't done yet. 
Um, let's say I'm looking at, at number seven here, problem number seven from this exercise. And if this was on the exam, I'd be asking you for which candidates fail the SCT and NCT for the target. The target is G. And G is actually never present here in the cases that we are looking at. But G is the target, and then the A, B, C, and D conditions are all the candidate features. So I want to test and see, is A sufficient for G? Is B sufficient for G? Is C sufficient for G? Is D sufficient for G? And is A necessary for G? Is B necessary for G? Is C necessary for G? Is D necessary for G? Each one of those is a hypothesis that I need to compare against the data and see if I've got any counterexamples. So with the sufficient condition test, the counterexample is a case where the candidate is present and the target is not. And we've got that for A. Um, both case 1 and case 3 are cases where our candidate is present, we see A is there, but the target is absent. We don't have G. So A fails the SCT for G in cases 1 and 3. Those are the cases that prove that it fails. Um, in the case of B, all three cases are counterexamples. So B fails the SCT for G in cases 1, 2, and 3. Um, C, we don't have any counterexamples for, so it passes the SCT for G. And D fails because of two cases, case 1 and case 2. When it comes to the necessary condition test, for 7, everything passes because we have no counterexamples. There are no cases where the target is present. So with no counterexamples, nothing fails the test. If you wanted to see a case where something failed the NCT, take a look at problem number 6. In problem 6, C is not necessary for G because you're getting G without C. You've got the target present, but you don't have a candidate. So case 1 would be a counterexample to the idea that C is necessary for G in problem number 6. Okay, how's that going for everybody? Good, 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 good. Wonderful. Okay, awesome. Um, I'm actually, in terms of uh, just thinking about time spent, um, we spent a good amount of time on SCT, NCT yesterday, and now we're talking about a little bit more too, and I'm, I'm happy to give you help for whatever you need, but there are a lot of other things on this exam um, to be thinking about and tracking. So um, I am kind of curious if, if there are other uh, types of inductive arguments um, that people want to take a look at. Uh, Adrian, you mentioned that you wanted to talk about statistical generalizations a little bit more. Is that right? Yep, okay, okay. Um, <clears throat> so let's take a look at some of these. Oh, that's applications. Any of these uh, from, from this exercise, uh, here, let's make it a little smaller so it fits uh, in my screen for recording. Okay, so this was exercise two from chapter eight. This is the one all about generalizations. Um, uh, any problems from here people would like me to talk about? I was on the phone with someone yesterday about number 10. 10 is really is the like culminating most complex difficult problem to tackle um, yeah 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 8 through 10 yeah yeah 8 is kinda tricky too um, so um, maybe we do does, do people want to go to just the hardest one do 10 unpack it should we do that I could kinda do that one as a demonstration since it's it's so tricky okay alright so um, Adrian I, I wanna ask you a question um, does the idea of a statistical generalization and a statistical application make sense? Like, you know, what, what's happening with that form of argument, or should we talk about that too? Okay, okay, so mostly it's a matter of evaluating them. Is that right? Yep. 
Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, um, with uh, on the exam, I will be asking you to. I, I'll I'll mix up the generalizations and applications. And the first thing you'll have to do is figure out if it's a generalization or an application. You'll know it's one of the two, but um, you'll have to figure out which which one it is. And this is really important because depending on which one you identify it as, you'll use a different set of criteria for evaluating whether it's strong. So if you misidentify um, whether it's a generalization or application, that could throw some of the rest of your answer for a loop. And actually, that could be a clue. If you're evaluating the argument and you're like, these standards don't seem to be like the right standards for this problem, then it might mean that you want to rethink whether your identification of it being a generalization or an application was, was correct. Um, the way to tell the difference between generalizations and applications is to ask what the conclusion is about. So in a applications and generalizations, you're going to have claims about a big category, the reference class, and then a smaller embedded category within that reference class that will either call the subset or the sample depending on whether it's an application or a generalization. But it's just two names for the same thing, the smaller category that's embedded in the reference class. So if the conclusion is about the reference class, it's a generalization. If the conclusion is about the smaller category, that would be the subset, that's an application. And so that's the way that you figure out which one is which, is what is the conclusion. And argument markers might help, like in this one. Here we've got a conclusion marker. Most murders can be deterred by the death penalty. So what's that talking about? Well, we're talking about people here, so this is a little tricky. Um, let, let, let me actually, on this one, let's start with the, the smaller category, which is up here in the premises, so that's also an indication that this is a, a generalization. Um, so they say, when hundreds of convicted murderers in states without the death penalty were asked whether they would have committed the murder if the state had a death penalty, most of them said that they would not have done it. So most murders can be deterred by the death penalty. So the, the smaller category, the sample here, the sample class, are the hundreds of convicted murderers in states without the death penalty that they talked to. That's who we're talking about. And if that's the smaller category, then what's going to be the larger category, the reference class? This one was a little tricky in 10 to identify. And what we're talking about are people. So it, it's, uh, it's about people here. And I think the best answer is something like potential murderers. The reference class is not just people who actually commit murders, because we're talking about whether they're going to be deterred or not. These are potential murderers. And property X, the claim in question here, is they would have been deterred by the death penalty. So the argument here is that because the hundreds of convicted murderers in states without the death penalty that we talked to would have been deterred from their crime if there had been a death penalty, therefore all potential murderers can be deterred by the death penalty. Okay? They can be deterred from their crime of murder by the presence of the death penalty. So that's the moving parts of the argument. Make sense? We got the reference class figured out, we got the sample class figured out, and we got the property in question figured out. So far so good? On the exam, I will be asking for the reference class and the sample or subset, and that's, it's really good to identify though. Even if I didn't ask for that on the exam, you would want to do that, because without that established, it's much harder to figure out how these standards apply for evaluating it. Okay, so <clears throat> first standard we have for generalizations, and again, these will be on the exam. You won't have to have them memorized. I'll, I'll list them for you. You just need to know what to do with them. The first standard asks about the sample size. And here, the size of the sample is hundreds. Well, we don't know exact number here, but we know hundreds were, of people were talked to. So that's probably pretty good in my book. Using my background assumptions here for sociological studies um, or psychological studies, I mean, if you're going to do in-person interviews or do a survey of these people, doing hundreds is a lot of work. Um, uh, uh, what, are you, what are you wondering, Lucy? Oh, you, you understand, Ted? Um, but I don't know what we should answer in it. Okay, so if, if this was on the exam, 
the first thing you'd have to tell me is, is it a generalization or an application? And the answer would be, it's a generalization. The next question I'll ask is, what's the reference class? And the reference class are potential murderers. And then I'll ask for what the sampler subset class is. And in this one, the answer would be the hundreds of convicted murderers in states without the death penalty that they talked to in this study. And then I will ask you, is this argument strong or weak? And utilize the standards of, of um, statistical generalizations or applications, whichever one it is, to evaluate the strength of the argument. So you have to use those principles to explain it. And you'll actually be expected to address every single standard, whether it's doing good or bad on that standard. So that's what we're doing right now. So the question uh, of is it strong or weak, the first thing we'd have to answer is whether it's doing good on sample size. And for my money, I think it's doing just fine. Hundreds is a lot. That's a lot of work. Um, and that's going to be a pretty significant sample. Uh, would it be better if it was thousands? Sure. But maybe that's impractical, <laughs> right? They'd be okay. Uh, having hundreds is pretty good. If they only talk to like five or a dozen or something, that's probably not enough. Um, but uh, hundreds, that's probably pretty, that's a pretty hefty sample size. That's probably okay. Um, so doing pretty good on sample size. Um, is this answering your question, Lucy? Okay. Cool. Second standard is sample bias. So is there any sample bias here? And remember, there's two questions we have to answer for this. First, is there some way in which the, the sample is not representative of the reference class? And the second question would be, if so, is the way in which it's not representative relevant to the property in question? Namely, would have been deterred by the death penalty. And I think there definitely is sample bias here. Because there's a big difference between the convicted murderers that were talked to and potential murderers. Convicted murderers have been, they've committed the crime, they've actually gone through and done it, they've been caught, they've been put on trial, sentenced, and they're serving their time. They're, you know, they're serving punishment. So they've gone through all of those experiences. And po potential murderers many of them have not. I mean, some potential murderers may have murdered before or been caught before and got out of jail and now they did another murder, but many of them are probably first-time offenders when it comes to murder. So they haven't gone through all those experiences. Now, is whether you went through those experiences or not something that's relevant to whether you'd be deterred by the death penalty? Seems like yes, right? That whether, if you've, if you've gone through all those experiences, then you might be more likely to rethink whether you want to do that again. As opposed to people who have not gone through that, they might not be thinking about that. Many criminals don't anticipate or think about what happens if they get caught. Um, they're they're you know, motivated by other things. So could they still be deterred by the death penalty? Maybe. But this is definitely going to be a factor or variable that influences whether they would be deterred or not. Those experiences could really change someone's outlook or way of doing the calculus of the decision making of whether they're going to go through with this or not. So I do think that there's sample bias. Does that make sense to everybody? This is a more complex problem, so it has more complex answers. But if it's making sense how I'm using the standard uh, in principle, that's the really important thing here. Looks like David's got a question maybe? kind of want to hear what David has to say here before I go further. Yeah, um, so David says, I agreed that there was sample bias, but I went a different route with it, assuming there were more murders in states that had the death penalty versus not. That would be an independent reason for thinking that this is true. Um, so that'd be like a different argument, David. That's working with different evidence. Um, the argument that's being offered here is that on the basis of these interviews with these convicted murders, that's why we should think that most murders could be deterred by the death penalty. So, but you know, one thing I do appreciate about what you're doing, David, is that 
uh, even though you're 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 kind of bringing in some irrelevant things, you're still thinking about things beyond just the problem that's that you're that's put in front of you. And for many of these standards, you got to be thinking that way, right? You got to be thinking about all your background assumptions about stuff. Um, but thinking of uh, alternate ways to defend the conclusion other than the argument that's being offered is not one of those things. Um, we are evaluating the reasoning that's being put forward in the problem. Um, so if you're like, yeah, I, I could I could give a different way of defending this that doesn't use statistical generalization or in this way, then cool. But, <laughs> you know, that'd be relevant for the debate. But it won't be relevant for evaluating whether this argument is compelling. Yeah, yeah. And Danny's got something. Can you explain why you think there's sample bias again? Yeah, so the, there's two questions for sample bias, formally, if you think about this in principle. The first question is, is there something about the, the sample class that isn't representative of the reference class, some way these things are different? Like, remember my example of only talking to members of the NRA to figure out what Americans think about gun control. Not all Americans are members of the NRA. That's a difference. In this case, um, the people that we talked to in the survey here are people who have gone through all these experiences of doing the crime and all the accountability for it, right? Getting caught, tried, convicted, sentenced, serving the, punish the punishment. Um, those experiences might change a person or they might change what's going on with them. That's different than what's going on with the reference class who are people who are potential murderers. So there's a difference there. Not all potential murderers have gone through those experiences. Okay. The second question, second formal question for confirming sample bias, is uh, that the way in which that's not representative is relevant to the claim in question, namely the property X part here, whether they would have been deterred by the death penalty. And do I think those experiences would affect whether someone would be deterred by the death penalty? Yeah, I think it would. Um, this isn't the case like uh, when I only talk to banana lovers to figure out whether what people think about gun control. The fact that not all Americans love bananas is not that's not a concern for sample bias because it's not relevant to what we're trying to figure out um, about people's opinions about gun control. I think this case is not like that. I think it's more like the NRA case where whether you're a member of the NRA is absolutely relevant to your opinions about gun control. So you have to you have to use your background assumptions here and think about ways in which the sample doesn't represent the reference class sort of it, it, it isn't fully representative of it um, is that going to pose a problem for the claim in question is there a relevant connection there between that Sebastian asks will all the questions be listed in order step by step for those types of problems um, uh, the questions the, in the instructions I mean you can see the um, the uh, study guide for exam two, it's up on Canvas, um, and I, I think I might have put it in a weekend update email here, um, <clears throat> in the last weekend update email. But there, the, this section will be broken down by all the questions I was mentioning earlier. So I, it'll be like part A, part B, part C, part D. So do you, what, whether it's a statistical generalization or an application, what's the reference class, what's the sampler subset, and then to evaluate the argument for strength using the criteria. And I will give you the criteria for statistical generalizations, and I'll give you the criteria for statistical applications. I'll basically give you what were the bolded bullet points from the lecture notes. Um, so you'll 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 see for statistical generalizations, um, sample size, sample bias, bias in investigation, bias in interpretation. For statistical generalization, you'll see how are the percentages doing. Um, and it, what's the is the reference class chosen the most relevant? That'll all be listed for you on the exam. <clears throat> big big point though um, that I do want to emphasize here is uh, you only use the criteria for the type of argument it is. So you're not going to talk about relevance of the reference class or the percentages cited. Those are the standards for application with a problem like number 10, which is a generalization. Sometimes I have students that do that, that kind of, I don't know, maybe they're hedging their bets and using both sets of standards, that, but that would be incorrect. You only use the, the set of criteria that are uh, assigned to the type of argument that you're evaluating here with induction. Okay, but there's two more standards to go through for number 10. Is there bias in investigation? This question is a matter of, do I think the information or the data that I've received in observing the sample accurately reflects what's truly going on with it? So what's the data here? The data 
is what these people say in these interviews. Most of them said that they would not have committed the crime. So do I think that data accurately reflects what is really going on with them? Um, and there could be concern here. There could be concern that since they are convicted murderers who are presumably serving their time, would they be interested in claiming uh, that they would have been deterred from, from the crime if uh, there had been a death penalty, even if it's not true? And it seems like yes, <laughs> you know, if you ask a criminal who's in jail, uh, so if, would, would you have committed this crime again? They're going to be like, no. You know, they might be trying to get out on parole. You know, there's, there's all sorts of reasons why they might want a posture of like, yes, I would have been deterred from doing this crime. I'm not the person who wouldn't have been deterred from doing this crime no matter what, you know. So I'm not sure I can take them at their word. I'm not sure that the evidence that is being collected accurately reflects what's going on with them. Okay, so that's bias in investigation. I do think there is concern for bias in investigation. Again, I don't have a smoking gun for it, but like I've said in my lectures before, I can indicate in my answer here what I might be suspicious of or what I might be concerned about in a way that demonstrates that you understand what bias in investigation is all about. Okay, so what about bias in interpretation? Bias in, inter in interpretation is where I take the data, basically the reports of what people said in these interviews, and then draw the conclusion from that that this sample has this property in question. The property in question is being deterred by the death penalty, not saying that you'd be deterred from the death penalty. It's being actually deterred. So when my question for bias and interpretation here is, okay, let's kind of bracket out the concerns about if they're lying or not. Let's say they're all being honest. You know, these convicted murderers I've talked to have gone through all these experiences. They look back and they're like, yeah, you know, I think, I think if there had been the death penalty, I wouldn't have done it. Let's say I think that they're being sincere in their self-report. Can I still trust that report as an indicator of what would have happened otherwise, kind of counterfactually, in the past? I'm not so sure we can do that. Um, I've got concerns about bias and interpretation here, because I'm not sure that people are have this kind of perfect or transparent access to what they would have done otherwise now that they're on the other side of it. You know, like hindsight's 2020. But also, once you go through those experiences, you are different. How you look at things is different. Can you get back inside the head of the person who hasn't gone through all those experiences yet and what they would be deciding? I'm not sure. So even, even if I trust the reports of these people in these interviews, I think there's still maybe cause for concern that this evidence is not going to be definitive in whether it's actually true that they would have been deterred by the death penalty. So that's my answer for 10. Going through each of the standards in turn, um, saying whether I think it's doing a good job with the standard or not, and then explaining my answers in a way that sort of demonstrates understanding of what that criteria is asking for. Andrew's got something for us here. Um, and if you got any questions about that story I just told about this um, or how it's a demonstration of how to do these generalizations, please let me know. If you also have other things that you want to talk about, drop it in the chat. Um, if we want to move on to another homework problem or, or some other part of what we got to do here. Andrew says, would the fact that some murders are passion crimes matter also? Well, that's what I'm kind of, that was what I was thinking in the back of my head is that, um, when someone is thinking about doing a crime like this, they may not be thinking about all the consequences. That's a background assumption that makes me think, you know, there was a, a sample bias here, that the people who've gone through these experiences are changed by it, and the people who um, are not going through, the, haven't gone through those experiences may not be tracking this variable very closely, like the criminals don't think they'll get caught kind of thing. Um, but yeah, if you wanted to also build in the detail about passion crimes, that makes a ton of sense. That like, yeah, they're not thinking, they're not doing a utilitarian calculus about whether this action makes the most sense for them or something. Yeah, yeah, definitely possible. So that'd be all the more reason to think this argument is not a strong one. Okay, what other stuff should we talk about?
How can I help? Number eight. Or exercise four, question ten. Um, which uh, chapter is exercise four from? Are you talking about uh, the applications here? Yeah. Okay. Um, I might move to that. Um, David, uh, maybe I'll say one thing here about eight. Just, just I'm trying to get some variety in here, so we we touch on all the different things that are are you know relevant for exam two here. Um, one thing about eight that's a little tricky is that it's kind of like a combo generalization and application, right? So there, there's, there's probably a kind of um, generalization about uh, all of Mary's children based on what's going on with their older children and then using what's true of all of her children to then make an application to her baby, right? Her, her newest child, her youngest child. Um, so there, there's a little bit of overlap here, but one thing that we might say here is that, I mean, this one was given to you under the statistical generalizations exercise, so you're, you're, you're sort of being nudged to look at it as a generalization. The generalization would be from the sample of her older children to the reference class of all her children, which includes the baby, okay? So the sample is really really good. I mean, it, the sample covers almost all the people, <laughs> with the exception of one. The reference class is the sample plus one more child, right? We don't know how many children Mary has, but um, the sample size is probably a, it's going to be the majority based on uh, the grammar here. It's going to be the majority of her children, um, so it's not a small slice of it. It's like most of it. So the sample size is probably doing pretty good. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay, so we could uh, take a look at my answers there too. If you want to talk more with me about it, David, we can do that. But let's take a look at this uh, application here from exercise four, question 10 from chapter eight. Um, most people who claim to be psychics are frauds. Mary claims to be a psychic. Mary is a fraud. So what is the reference class here? This is an application, that's right, yep. People who claim to be psychics, that's right, that's a reference class. And what's the subset class then? What's the smaller category? Um, Parker, I, I don't know if that answer was for the previous question, but that's not um, correct. No. No, the, the subset is going to be the smaller category that's within the category of people who claim to be psychics. Mary, that's right. Yep, Mary is the subset here. And what's the property in question? Property in question is being a fraud. Okay, so on the basis that most of the reference class have the property of being a fraud, and Mary is in that class, therefore Mary is al also has that property of being a fraud. The reference class and the sample or subset are not going to be full claims. They're going to just be identifying the subjects that we're talking about, which could be an individual person or thing, or a whole set of things, like a category. Um, reference classes are almost always going to be bigger categories, not not just one thing, right? but a set of things. Okay, so um, the, there are two standards we have for how to evaluate applications. Um, how is the percentage doing, and then the relevance of the reference class? Uh, yes, Lucy, this is in standard form. Yeah, yeah, they, they presented these problems in standard form. On the exam, I will not be doing that. 
I'll just give it to you in prose, kind of like the statistical generalization section here. They just they didn't put it into standard form. Yeah. Okay. So is the percentage doing well? Well, all we've got to work with here is most. <laughs> That's all they say. Most people. And as we said in the lecture, most is pretty ambiguous. So if if this was on the exam, I I would totally take an answer that was like. I don't know how good uh, the percentage is doing because I, I can't tell what most means. I mean, most could be pretty close to 50% or it could be pretty close to 100%. If it was close to 100%, it'd be stronger. If it was close to 50%, it would be weaker. So there, even if you don't know all the details, you can still give an answer that demonstrates your understanding of this criteria and what matters. Um, but the, the bigger thing here for this one is the relevance of the reference class. So if you were trying to figure out that whether Mary is a fraud or not, focus your attention on that. Is Mary a fraud or not? Mary is a member of many reference classes or potential reference classes. Why choose this one? Is figuring out the fact that Mary is in this category of people who claim to be psychic, is that the most important reference class for figuring out whether someone's a fraud? What do you think? This is going to depend on your background assumptions. The kind of question is, are there any better reference classes? You know, is there something else? Um, Lucy is asking, can I say Mary is psychic? So she is a fraud? I mean, that's what the argument is saying. That, that wouldn't be, it, that would just be repeating the argument rather than evaluating it. Do you think that it, when it comes to figuring out if people are frauds or not, looking to see whether they claim to be psychic is one of the best ways to go about doing that? Or are there other things that we should be looking for, like the, whether she's in or isn't in certain other categories? So that's true, Andrew. You can be a fraud and not claim to be psychic, which just means there's other potential reference classes here um, for figuring out whether someone's a fraud or not. And what you'll have to do is critically evaluate, should we be looking at this, the, Mary's membership in this reference class as the best way to gain insight into whether she's a fraud or not, or are there are alternative ones we could be using instead? Think, think back to my example from the lecture about figuring out if a teacher is good when you just met him on the first day. I mean, there's a lot of reference classes you could choose from to try to gain insight or have an indicator that this is a good teacher or a bad teacher. And picking out just one of them, if, if that's going to be a good argument, we have to think about what are the other possible arguments that could have been made instead. Why should we look at this feature as a, a sort of crucial variable? This is inductive reasoning, so it's never going to be definitive. I mean, Andrew, your, your comment about how you can be a fraud and not claim to be a psychic is really kind of like a point of formal logic that this would never be a uh, you know, de demonstrable fact, uh, an absolute proof or something. But we already accept that with induction. Uh, the question is, is this the best way to go looking for indicators that the subset has the claimed feature? So I said here that this, this really depends on your background assumptions here. Um, that like, uh, if someone's going to be a fraud, I mean, a, a real big acid test for this is what's going on with claiming to be a psychic, right? I, I think it's probably doing pretty good. Again, we're, we're kind of taking it for granted that the premises are true and wondering if they're true, does that give good reason to think the conclusion is true? So if you were like, well, I actually don't think most psychics are frauds. Well, that's, not, that's actually not required. You don't have to get into that to evaluate this. But given that that's true, that most people who claim to be psychics are frauds, um, is that a good indicator of this? I think so. Um, part of my background assumptions are that um, claiming to be a psychic is something that is probably not just a small part of your life, but maybe a bigger part of your life. Um, like it could be part of your livelihood. So the fact that you're willing to do something fraudulent with something that's such a big part of your life 
may be an indicator that in general you are, are going to work that way. Okay, we're, we're out of time for today. Um, I just want to remind you that tomorrow is going to be the same kind of game as today. Um, I'm just going to come in here and see what people want to be talking about. And I will let you kind of um, dictate the agenda. <laughs> so I'll, we'll, we'll spend our time and attention wherever you direct it. So please come to class prepared to do that um, and have stuff that you want to talk about. Oh, yes, code. Yeah. Um, uh, let's do fraud. That's good. Code. Code word is fraud. So, um, yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, um, please, please come to class prepared to uh, come up with stuff that you want to talk about. Take a look at the, uh, the study guide for the exam. Maybe take a look at the answers I sent out last night. Um, finish up the homework. Um, at least trying to do some of the problems from each section. Um, maybe we want to talk about inference of best explanation and argument from analogy tomorrow. If there are leftover things about formal logic that you'd like to review too, we can do that as well. And I'm also going to have the opportunity this afternoon. So from 1.30 to 2.30, uh, I will be here and um, available to talk to. So uh, anyone thinking that they're going to be there? Um, I, um, hmm, not joined till later. Okay. Um, I, I actually have an appointment lined up. Um, I could probably uh, talk for a couple minutes here, but I have to, I have to make a phone call. What did you want to ask? Okay. Two, eight. Um, this is from, are you talking about the statistical generalizations? Oh, the baby one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. What, what's the question? Maybe a, a, is there a particular standard you're curious about with this one? If people have to go, you're free to, you're free to leave. Class is dismissed, but I'll, I'll hang around here and, and, and answer a little question. Why is the baby included? Um, well, that's the thing that she wants to make a conclusion about. I mean, the, the reference class is all of her children, um, but the fact that the reference class differs from the sample only by one person, the baby, it means that anything we're saying about the reference class that's over and above what's true of the sample just concerns the baby. Okay. And everyone, please, um, if you want to get a hold of me over the phone and stuff too, by all means, look me up. Um, I, I have been pretty busy on the phone the last few days. My political philosophy students are having big papers due and everything, um, so I've been talking a lot with them. But you're you're also uh, students cool. that I have, I have a high priority for because of the exam. So um, if you want some help with things, I want to help you with it. Okay, I'm going to shut down the video.